Welcome to the latest in our series looking at Ireland's Olympians, those who will be competing on the track, in the pool and in various different locations in Tokyo 12 months from now, as well as those who are playing a big part in actually getting them there. One of those people I'm really pleased to be joined by today is Sinead Galvin, who runs Galvin Sports Management and has a team of athletes that she looks after their interests on, off the track. Uh, Sinead, you're very welcome to Sport for Business. Um, tell me a little bit about how the lockdown has, has been for you as a sports agent. Um, well, thanks, Rob, for having me on. Um, I suppose the lockdown, I think, much like everybody else, at the very beginning, um, I think I genuinely was so hopeful that the games weren't going to be pulled. Um, both the Olympics and Paralympic Games. I just kept hoping. Um, I suppose the penny dropped at me a bit earlier than it probably did with the athletes because I think they can be quite blinkered as they need to be in terms of being focused in on the performance. And then when it became official, I suppose my main concern at that point was around the athletes' welfare. I'm only a small part of their support system. Obviously, they have their coaches, their family the supports in the institute but I was very conscious that I am somebody that they rely on so I reached out to see how they were how things were going their reactions um, and then I suppose it did move to okay what's the state of play for the business side of things for for them in terms of the partnerships that they have people who have bought into them because of the fact that this is the big year you know I work with amazing athletes and they're incredible and um, I want to give them a voice and I want to link them with opportunity and this is the one big year for them to shine <laughs> I just thought okay what's going to happen now you know I was almost a little bit frozen I'll be honest at the very beginning kind of trying to digest it consider how it was going to play out was there any chances of some competition to keep them to the fore because um, I suppose I would always say to them, you know, I did, I'm a marketeer, that's my background, I'm all about the four P's, but my four P's of athlete representation, the one big pillar is performance. So, you know, if you take away that pillar, you know, what else do they have to offer in this particular year? So a lot of those things were going through my head, Rob, at the very beginning. You've got a great empathy. And I think from talking to the athletes in, in your team, they, they like the personal side of the relationship they have with you. You're like a big sister to, to them in a, in a sense. That, you know, sense of looking after them, and you're quite right, there would be a blinkered mentality in terms of, you know, doing the right thing. And even in lockdown, making sure that you were doing the right physical prep and keeping things going. But the mental well-being must have been a real challenge for a lot of them because when you're working towards a goal that has been not only four years, but in many cases, eight or 12 years out as a, as a single beacon on the horizon, that's now gone. How did they cope generally? And how did you find that you were able to actually help them to step over that line that could have been quite dark? Um. I would almost say it was a little bit like a grieving process. Um, and I think if we all think about losing this sport in a year, it's been a bit like that. Some people came to acceptance a lot quicker. People were sad, people were angry. People on my team definitely would have seen it as also part of a bigger societal issue. You know, they had to row in and do their part and understand that you know the people's life like people were dying so you know that became I think the bit that allowed them to process it a lot easier but even within that it was still incredibly difficult if you focus a full four years towards something or a lot longer for somebody like as Ree said making those Olympic Games he had that in his head since he was eight years of age um, and thankfully they all have spoken very openly about how that, that has been challenging for them. Reese has spoken about it. Ellen spoke about it in RT News and saying that she just had one day where she just couldn't get through a session and she was crying and she realized, okay, I need to reach out to my teammates. I miss, it's an individual sport, but I miss my teammates. I need to rally around in that. And I think 
the gear shift mentally as well, like dialing down where their heads were at. I always say that um, when it comes to season, I call it the narky season with athletes because um, it's when they get a bit more tense and a bit more intolerant of things. And so they were cranking up to that part of the, of the season and then that was stripped away. So I think the moving down in the gear was really important. Someone like Thomas Barr is an Olympian. Um, he is somebody I would feel has an incredible kind of ability to dial up and down as needed and he very quickly moved into things and realized okay I'm just going to pull back move to conditioning it's fine and a lot of the others would work with psychologists thankfully um, but from my perspective it was about the whatsapp messages having a call if they needed a call um, and I think also as well letting them know how you know me I'm a parent I have two boys and um, you know, I'm working, my husband works, we were trying to do homeschooling, survive. And I think them understanding what was going on in the wider context was really good as well to have an appreciation of some of the overall challenges of what were going on. But as a team, we also did a couple of Zoom calls because they were needed. But I also said to them, look, this is a really good chance for you to maybe look at parts of your own personal brand development that you haven't had the opportunity to reflect on before did some really nice work um, around social media with the team some of them as always with these things some of them were great hit the ground running and have really seen the benefits already of it and um, worked on, with some of them on their speaker profile so try to say okay what can we can I do as you know somebody who works as your athlete representation during this time to give you that little bit of extra edge but then equally they were great for me um, they, you know, a time when I was kind of not struggling a little bit, Ellen organized a full Team GSM quiz and that was really good fun. So I think that sense of team togetherness, doing a, a funny TikTok that they did over Easter, all of those things. But again, I'm always conscious that I'm just a cog in the overall wheel of their support team. But for a lot of them, I would like to think, think that I am their friend as well, which, you know, I treat them as a friend, you know, reach out to them, they reach out to me and that side of things as well. That's a great way to be. The, that, that sense of them working on areas other than the physical perfection that they're aiming towards in, in the sport. Do you think it's hard to say that a lot of good will come from, from everything that we've been through, but for, for some, that will be a really important part of their transition, their eventual transition from being an elite high performance athlete into being a rounded human being that lives in the real world, that has all of those uh, you know, challenges and, and problems to overcome. So do you think, do they appreciate that or are they still at the stage of, of being very much in the zone? I think it depends on the athlete. Some people would have probably reflected more. I think what it definitely showed them was how much they're going to miss their sport when it's gone because there is a day when they're going to retire when you know their goggles are hung up their spikes are hung up um, and I think that bit of the realization has I've no doubt when they go back to their condition and base training and those type of things will give them their fire in the belly and they've already spoken about that about how they now realize how much they will miss it and what they're going to and give it everything you know, for the Olympics and the Paralympic Games, they're just so focused in on it. And um, I definitely think it did allow a bit more time for reflection in, of what some of them might like to do, work on, um, and realize that when, you know, for me, I'm trying to encourage them to always spend a little bit of time on their personal brand development so that it helps with transition. But I'm up against, you know, lifting lots of time in the pool or on the track or on the pommel horse or whatever it might be so you know um they they have to have priorities and i completely understand that but i think it showed to them if they are focused on that that they can get rewards and that was that was good for them to see that you mentioned earlier it's it's unfortunate in terms of those sports that live outside of the big four or maybe the big yeah. five that, that we have here in ireland that Olympics is the gold standard. It's where everybody wants to be associated with the winners and it comes around once every four years at, the, at this senior level. The, there, was a, there was a good sense of momentum building behind commercial partnerships, both with Team Ireland and with a number of the individual athletes. How have those relationships been nurtured throughout? Because some businesses will be going through uh, you know, some real challenges yeah. of their own. And and yet nobody has 
wanted to pull away from sport and sponsorship because it's still a very uncertain area as to where things are going to go. But they've decided to stick with it, which is great because sport will be a key part of the recovery. Um, but how has that nurturing process been in terms of managing the relationships and, and managing expectations where we're 12 months later for the big payday? Well, I think that's where when I shifted from the athlete welfare into the commercial relationships that I started picking up the phone, that I start reaching out to sponsors to get a sense of what was going on. And I have to say, thankfully, for the most part, it's been really good news for the team. And actually, we've had a couple of contract wins during lockdown, which has been fantastic. Like it's been really good to see that brands can still see the opportunity and they see what's available and that's been outside of the um, Team Ireland or Paralympic sponsors. So that has been really good to see. Yeah, there has been one or two losses in the time. I'll be honest in saying that businesses that were struggling that had partnerships have said, look, we can't fulfill the second part of it. Um, but I'm always aware, uh, Rob, you know, I started working with Thomas Barr just after he came back from Rio. That was my very first client. Um, and I actually was quite interested in listening to the Team Ireland pieces that they were doing about gender balance and I was reflecting myself because they spoke about it's not just women back and women, it's men back and women as well and I thought there were three men who actually supported me for Team Ireland, one was David Gillick who reached out to me at the time and was like you need to do this, you would be great as an agent uh, Thomas who I'd worked with before believed in me and was willing to sign as me even though I'd never worked with anyone and then there was my husband so it was just an interesting trio of men who were like you can do this you can make it happen even at times if I was like what the hell am I doing but my point being that that very first point of junction with Thomas all of the Team Ireland sponsors were gone at that point so there was nobody and now I know Rio was a, quite a complex time but generally speaking um you're the sponsors in those areas come in for 18 months and then they're gone again and then they come back in. So they're not there for the 48 months. So with Thomas, I very much, and we got some very interesting sponsorship um, proposals in the time of which we said no to. Um, but we worked with people that we felt were going to be with him for the Olympic cycle because, because of my understanding of performances individually. You know, if you get a six out of 10, or a seven out of 10 as a team player, you're still on the Irish squad. If you're an, an international athlete, that's the difference between maybe not making a semi-final or maybe not making a final or maybe not making a podium. So I know the margins are so tight that you need a sponsor that's going to back you throughout that. And that came to fruition definitely with Thomas because after the Olympics, he went to London, picked up a virus and wasn't able to compete, but his sponsors were already on board. So um, I was mindful of that coming into 2020 to ensure that the mix was right for athletes to work with Team Ireland and Paralympic sponsors, but also to keep the door open for other people as well. Um, it's great now that the Rule 40, that there's a little bit more flexibility in that. And actually, that's an upside of this scenario because that had only really kind of come out around end of February time. So for me, that's an interesting one as a, you know, move towards reaching out to brands again um, outside of the Team Ireland pot. There's also another interesting challenge for track athletes. So their biggest sponsor is their kit sponsors. So the scenario has very much changed now with um, anyone who comes on board as the kit sponsor for Olympic teams are saying, you know, if there's, if there's a situation where there is a sponsorship event for another sponsor, then they need to be in the kit. So obviously for anybody, and this would include, you know, Dina Asher in the in G Team GB, she's a Nike athlete. She's not going to stand there in Adidas kit. So for um, certain athletes that I would work with on the track team who have kit deals, they can't, they, they're not in a position to um, actually uh, work with some of the Team Ireland sponsors as a result of those challenges. So they need to look outside of that and, and look for other sponsors. So um, yeah, I would say during this whole process that people have been, I would have found that anyone working with the athletes were very honest if they weren't able to continue. And those that were, were like, look, we're, we're going to continue. We don't have all the details yet. And that gave athletes peace of mind as well. So I, I found them to be very fair. They see the value in it and they're not going to drop out of it now just because it's been pushed on a year. Thankfully.
that's a real fascinating insight as well into the sort of the mechanics behind the the individual versus the team partnerships and it's something which we'll we'll pick up again over the over the course of the year um it'll be great to hear as well what some of those sponsorship proposals for thomas might have been but maybe we'll wait until <laughs> the book comes yeah. out after he's uh, moved on to the next chapter um one of the one of one of the the athletes that we had in this series earlier on shane ryan spoke about the potential for 21 versus 20 giving rise to a number of younger athletes having that extra 12 months to develop and that we may see some Olympians coming through that might not otherwise have made it. Somebody like Patience Jumbo Gala now, who is, it, who, who is one of the athletes that yeah. you represent, that extra 12 months could make a, a huge difference for her? Um, so for Patience, it's slightly different. So Patience, um, it would be potentially, she's on the four by one meter relay team the Athletics Ireland that were identified as having high potential after winning the world um, junior silver medal. Phenomenal group of athletes, like super. Uh, Kieran Evels on that team as well. Um, and yeah, a great, you know, Jean is on that team as well, Molly Scott. But the challenge for them is, okay, for Olympic qualification, I'm going to get technical now, my athletics <laughs> knowledge. They are currently ranked about kind of mid-20s, 20s, 20, fifth in the world the four by one relay team to qualify for the olympics you need to be 16th in the world top 16 in the world so that's a challenge that's going to be a real challenge for them to actually make it within within that time so i would say that yes i'd be hopeful of athletics ireland finding the right right race opportunities for those girls to get together in race and um, because that's the only way that at this point in time, because they're another four years off individual qu qualification. Kira Neville is actually in the bubble of qualification. So she could potentially qualify in the 100 metres through rankings. So she's the, the on the sprint side of things, Phil already is qualified through the ranking systems. Um, and uh, Kira is a good chance within the ranking system as well. For the rest of the girls, they're actually well off individual rankings just yet at this point in time and the four by one unfortunately has an outside very outside chance at this point in time but again when I signed when I start working with patients I just I really like her attitude I really like her as a person I believe in her and I'm fine with that being three four years down the road that it ends up happening you know and in a way a lot of that team have an awful lot of pressure on them and I think people don't quite understand the difference of people winning European youth medals and them actually getting junior under 23 and senior medals like it's such a difference and that's actually evident in the ranking system now so you can see where some of those girls who've done brilliantly like absolutely brilliantly at youth level broken records everything like that but they're like 200 and whatever it's in the world you know so they've a journey to go but i've every faith that not this cycle but the next one after we'll see all those amazing talent names coming through Great, we, we do, we live in a firefly world and, uh, and that's why it's always important to get that deeper level of understanding because the athletes are living it day in, day out and we just yeah. hop along and we see it on a back page or on, uh, you know, on the top of a website or on a very limited period of time. Just before I let you go, the, the, the Olympic Games and the Paralympic Games will, with the blessing of God and vaccines and everything else permitting, take place 12 months on from now in Tokyo. Picture yourself in terms of the team of athletes that you have at your disposal now or that might, might join you over the course of the coming months. What do you, what do you see the best case scenario being for, for both you and your athletes in Tokyo delayed? Um, I got goosebumps even thinking about it. So that's the first, I feel rather first before I think on it. Um, but that's sport, that's the glorious sport. Um, I think, you know, I would love to see from a qualification point of view, you spoke about some of these on the cusp. Nadia Power has an opportunity actually in the 800 metres. I'd love to see that year working for her to get into those rankings because she medaled under 23. That's really bumped her up in the rankings. So I'd love to see her line up. Um, Reese is open. Reese is on that podium. You know, that's, he's put that out there as it. Thomas, I want to see him in that final again. Um, Kieran McGeehan has never made an Olympic final. Would absolutely um, love to see her uh, lining up in a final. And Ollie Dingley, who 
like absolutely won over Ireland when he, you know, qualified and then made the final, you know, he's had a challenging time with a couple of injuries and things like that. And, got sick at the Europeans and like things just have not gone his way. And I want to see him nail that qualification and show people what an incredible athlete he is. And then for people like Phil Healy to get it like an amazing kind of Olympic experience. Um, I can't go without saying the Paralympic crew as well, you know, Jordan Lee, high jumper, he's looking for qualification. Neve um, McCarty and Ellen Keane have done Ireland so proud in terms of the medals they get. And, you know, a lot of the times we talk about, 20 by 20 and women in sports and sometimes we need to step back from that and go okay there's actually a wider picture here as well there's people who are competing with disability who are incredible athletes who even less so than olympic olympians get a light shone on them or people really really understanding them as athletes and um you know i I think it's important that we we move the conversations there as well um so yeah i just i just feel excited for them you know but i also know sport i mean of the those aspirations you know three of the six of them might only come through um but that's that's sport again i just want to see it happen rob it just I, <laughs> you know number one as a sports fan and just knowing those athletes i just want them to have the opportunity to compete and what is you know their moment the moment that they go through so much. They sacrifice so much as individual sports people. And I just want them to have that moment to shine. And um, so, yeah, that's when I think about it. It has been a pleasure as always having a chat with you, Sinead. Um, great to produce goosebumps as well, even though we're not at the Olympics at the moment. It's only delayed. But for now, Sinead Galvin of Galvin Sports Management, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Rob. <laughs>